We are part of a continuum, a strong legacy that rolls out from the sacrifices, the blood, sweat, and tears of those who walk these same paths that we walk today with a steady beat and with weary feet. You may ask, what does this have to do with me, preacher? The Spirit is leading me to tell somebody today that our ancestors were the first to walk this earth. Someone needs to know that it was our ancestors, our African foreparents that brought civilization, religion, and science and the art. It is my hope that today's words can serve as a spiritual reboot, if you wanna say, a black consciousness upgrade. You see, both are necessary and essential because of all the negative viruses that are infecting and affecting us. You have to let go of what you can't keep in order to gain what you can't lose. This palm tree was trying to tell you, this young lady was trying to tell you that she as a palm tree has to let go of what she can't keep. She can't keep the concrete in order to gain what she can't lose, her peace, her sanity, her life. You have to let go of these, these shackles. You have to let go of this concrete around your feet, around your roots, around your brain. You have to let go of that slave mentality. We can liken that palm tree to many who were put on slave ships, who were shipped here, bound, the worst conditions ever. They were brought here in chains, stripped of everything. No family, no friends, no life. Brought here to create a society, a world that they knew nothing about. But there's a silent sin that, that no one tells you about when you join a church. Pastor didn't tell you in the invitational that sometimes it feels like walking with God is futile. He didn't tell you that sometimes being in the movement for the liberation of black people can feel thankless. Sometimes it feels lonely. He didn't tell you that sometimes it can be unforgiving. Why do I keep praying, yet there seems to be no answers? Why do I keep coming to church on Sunday, but nothing on Monday? Why do I keep fighting for the liberation of African people, yet we refuse to let go of the shackles of our mental slavery? We ask ourselves at times. As long as we show up and give the best that we can give, there is cosmic support to fill in the gaps. We pray, great ancestral spirit, always to remember the miracles of yesterday. And we pray for the willingness to be open to the miracles of tomorrow. Miracles o divine host of hosts, we beseech your eternal love, hope, and compassion upon the lives and condition of your chosen us. people. Prepare Today our spirit, body, minds for the challenges and ordeals that may obstruct spirit. our path Continue to your covenant to promise. Miracles. Remove all doubt and Spirits. reservation that may hinder us from acting for you season. and the world. I'm Embolden ashamed. our walk that we may share the light of group salvation to seekers in search of a sign from you. O oh, cosmic goddess of creation, at a time such as this, be the light of hope and reconciliation that proves us worthy for building a kingdom with power here on earth. We send this collective petition to you, trusting that you have weighed our concerns among many. We trust your judgment will be swift one, and decisive. Our grand source way from maker, all let us continue flow. to strive for liberation, Lord of hosts, leaving godly matters to you. Insight, we ask this in all prayers in the name of our revolutionary example of great expectations. Jesus, the Lord, Black Messiah, our hearts, Ashe. our eyes, our Amen. minds, and our spirits are fully open to receive whatever your will and way determines is best for our collective well-being. Lord, keep us ever vigilant as we prepare, sacrifice, and work alongside our ancestral allies 
to build a better world for our people everywhere. Most High, during this season of Advent, grant us the spirit of compassion, the spirit of faith, the spirit of hope, and the spirit of love as we anticipate the incarnation of divine energy and power to be born anew within each of us. This prayer we pray in the name of our messianic agent and revolutionary example, Jesus of Nazareth. And we say Ashe and Amen. Today, black people are experiencing a rising level of consciousness that is raising our self-concept. Today, black women constitute the most educated segment of American society. Shrines of the Black Madonna, where we believe in you being your best self. We invite you to partake in our worship experience. Come with an open mind and an open heart. Sing, dance, and clap your hands. Follow us on all of our social media platforms. Giving is an opportunity for us to build community, ministry, health, and best self. Tap into your greatness that God has already placed inside of you and share it with the world. We would love to see you more often. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I believe that human society stands under the judgment of one God, revealed to all and known by many names. His creative power is visible in the mysteries of the universe. In the revolutionary Holy Spirit, which will not long permit men and women to endure injustice, nor to wear the shackles of bondage and the rage of the powers when they struggle to be free. And in the violence and conflict, which even now threaten to level the hills and the mountains. I believe that Jesus, the Black Messiah, was a revolutionary leader sent by God to rebuild the Black nation Israel and to liberate African people from powerlessness, from the oppression, brutality, and exploitation of the white Gentile world. I believe, I believe, I believe that the revolutionary spirit of God embodied in the black Messiah is born anew in each generation. And that black Christian nationalists constitute the living remnants of God's chosen people in this day and are charged by God with responsibility for the liberation of African people. I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. That both my survival and my salvation depend upon my willingness to reject individualism. And so I commit my life to the liberation struggle of African people and accept the values, ethics, morals, and programs of the black nation defined by that struggle and taught by the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church. We voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the
Stony the road we tried, bitter the chastening ride, felt in the days when hope unborn had died, felt with a steady To the place for which our father sighed. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on till victory. Get connected and stay connected online with the Shrine of the Black Madonna Virtual Village. Worship, join, learn, give, connect with us all in one place in just three easy steps. One, go to our landing page via our link tree URL or QR code. Two, browse our selections and decide what you want to do and where you want to go. Three, Click on your choice and we'll take you right there. Yes, in just three easy steps, you can worship, join, learn, give, all in one place. So get connected and stay connected with us online at the Shrine of the Black Madonna Virtual Village. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. In, 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 my, in, in our household, in Walker Nation, I'm the, the, the principal school chauffeur. I don't have serious XM. So when I'm driving to and from school, I'm usually playing music or going to YouTube to listen to Karen Hunter or Dr. Greg Carr or, or somebody. But the other day, I... I was kind of tired of that same old routine and I wanted to give audio books a try. There's a, a gazillion books on my to read list. I'm always in the car, so let, let's, let's give it a shot. My wife has a, an Audible account. She said I could use it for a small fee. <laughs> I got on there and I, I saw a book that I've been meaning to, to purchase, Michael Harriet's Black AF History, The Unwhitewashed Story of America. I got it on Audible and, and started reading it immediately, and I'm really, really glad that I did. I still prefer real tangible books, but the audio books offer me another tool at my disposal in my quest for lifelong learning. And what was clear from the little part of Harriet's book that I've listened to so far is that black folk, we have a long history of using the tools at our disposal to do great things. Whatever we have nearby or at hand, we use that to push back or to build or to make a way out of no way simply by using those things and those resources and those skills at hand available to us. Our scripture today and the Bible story surrounding it reminds us of this 
black AF ability that we possess. The scripture comes from 1 Samuel 17, verse 40. And it says this. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in hand, approached the Philistine. And our topic, using the tools at our disposal. Like our presiding bishop preached last week, so many of us, so many of our people are oblivious to the absolute dangers of the times in which we live. On January 6th, just a few years ago, this country was just a handful of people and a handful of decisions away from destroying and ending American democracy. And as we worship right now, one of the main behind the scenes architects of that illegal treasonous insurrection is the Speaker of the House, third in line to the presidency. As we speak, the leader of that insurrection is the far and away front runner to become the Republican Party's nominee to run for president in 2024. And his henchmen and henchwomen are basically running the show in Congress, ready to officially rewrite the U.S. Constitution and install their, to use the phrase of our presiding bishop, to install their Peckerwood Messiah as Lord and King of America. Yes. As we gather together right now, praising the Lord, white domestic terrorism is rising. White militias ready themselves for race war. Environmental dangers go unattended. Apartheid American style gets new life and new examples right now. Haters of black life and liberty are using our public tax dollars to fund white private education and defund public schools. Women are being reduced to members of the handmaid's tale. An epidemic of black women and children are going missing and no one seems to care. And even with black imprisonment rates going down, arrests and police brutality is at the same ungodly rate. And on the heels of news that black women are the most educated demographic in the country and more black children are graduating from high school and earning degrees, all of those things that white folks said we need to be doing, black teachers are under attack for doing the very things that have improved our educational outcomes. Black history and black books and black perspectives which have empowered young black minds and which have been the only thing that allowed this country to show any semblance of being a democracy are being banned and outlawed. And those who teach them are being harassed, fired, or threatened with arrest. And then we have the international events that could have disastrous impacts upon the planet, specifically the Palestine-Israel conflict, a conflict most black folk on TV are tiptoeing around when they speak about it. But they're tiptoeing around because the pan-Israel community has the institutional power to punish and destroy anyone who says anything they don't like. It doesn't have to be anti-Semitic. They just have to declare that what you said is anti-Semitic. Right. And folk are losing jobs, losing scholar college scholarships, organizations and institutions are losing grants, Individuals are being socially and publicly canceled, harassed, and threatened. This summer, award-winning author and journalist Ta-Nehisi Coates spoke at a literary festival on the West Bank, right there in Palestine. 
It was the Palestine Festival of Literature. Literature. They call it Pow Fest. And it was an event that connected the Palestinian struggle to the decolonization struggles around the world. More specifically, it was connecting their struggle with black folks struggle right here. Coates, unlike most folk, isn't tiptoeing around the issue. He joined several other writers and artists in signing an open letter calling for the international community to commit to ending the unfolding Gaza catastrophe. More recently, Coates participated in another Pow Fest event right here in the U.S. at Union Theological Seminary in New York after four other locations refused to host the event. And when he was asked about his time this summer in Palestine and Israel, Coates said what shocked him the most was that even though everyone said how complicated the Palestine-Israel conflict was, he said he expected to see a situation in which it was hard to discern right from wrong, hard to understand the morality at play, but even with all that, he said when he got there, he immediately understood what was going on. Well, Apartheid. Well, His words, I was in a region of the world where some people could vote and some people could not. And that was very familiar to me. Well, but folk who have had, who have nothing to do with Hamas, folk who are not condoning or supporting their actions to kidnap or kill Jews, Israelis. These folks still are being attacked for standing up for the rank and file Palestinian people. But just rank and file human beings, women and children and mothers and grandmothers and daughters and sons and uncles, civilians who are being bombed and tortured and killed. They ain't had nothing to do with no Hamas. Folk who have been and are right now being thrown out of their homes. Homes that have been in their family for four, five, six, seven generations so that Jewish settlers can come in and occupy them. I mean, Lord have mercy, where they do that at? Just walk up in your home and throw you out. Not to mention that indiscriminate bombing and violence, it just continues every day. That conflict is something some pundits argue could spiral out of control and turn into World War III. Why? Because powers are lining up on both sides. Some folk are lining up with Israel. Some powers are lining up with Palestine. And they're sending troops. We got U.S. troops over there right now. Anything could set it off at any minute. Life. Normalcy as we know it could be over and gone forever. There's also a global reckoning that we could come upon from a place that nobody seems to have their eyes on. That nobody seems to be concerned about. There's the absolutely abysmal humanitarian crisis that's going on right now in the Democratic Republic of the Congo on the African continent. Ain't nobody talking about that. <laughs> nobody. But it's impacting nearly six million black people. Wracked by decades of conflict, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, it's said is the most complex and long-standing humanitarian crisis on the continent of Africa. And it has the fourth largest IDP, the fourth largest number of internally displaced population. That means the folk that live there can't live in their homes. And so they're on the streets or they're on the outskirts or they're just trying to figure out how to make it day, day to day. More than 5 million people are displaced within the country and more than 1 million Congolese have sought asylum in other countries, but while they're seeking asylum in other countries, there are other folk, <clears throat> a half a million refugees from other nations that are seeking asylum in the Congo. So the Congo is just one 
of over 30 conflicts on the African continent that could impact the welfare and well-being of black folk in the pan-African world for generations to come. And so what I'm trying to say is these are some dangerous, crazy, and perilous times. And most of us, most black folk, we just oblivious to these ticking time bombs that are all around us. Oblivious to all the many threats to our existence, living life as if nothing's wrong, tap dancing on landmines. Black people, as our presiding bishop reminded us last week, lacking a, a revolutionary mindset that would allow us to see things from a common, singular, communal perspective, we all over the place. We're not, we're all over the place. Some see hitching their wagon to the Republican train is the answer. They want to align themselves with the GOP strongman dictator. We got some young folk who say our strategy should be to just let it all burn. Just let it all collapse and burn to the ground so that we can build a new society from the ashes. Not realizing that if we sit back and let all the madness burn, that we will either be re-enslaved or there won't be anything left to rebuild. Some want violent revolution or what our beloved founder, the Honorable Jeremoji of Abe Ajman, called acts of blind rage, which are just acts of suicide. Some choose apathy. Some throw themselves into escapism. Many openly declare war on voting, saying it doesn't make a difference openly criticizing and demeaning black organizations, but offering no alternative actions, no alternative organizations to enact change. So what then do we do? Where does this leave us? Well, I want to turn to scripture because I think we can find an answer in the Bible story surrounding today's scripture. It's the story of David and Goliath. But the answer, I believe, is in a different telling of that very familiar story. One that frames the characters in a radically different light. And it's a telling of the story made popular by the writer and thinker, Malcolm Gladwell. Gladwell contends that we are misreading both David, the small, insignificant underdog, and Goliath, the invincible man of war. Gladwell argues that David was of the archer slinger tradition. For the Hebrews, members of the artillery, let me know the score, members of the artillery, the archers and the slingers were experts wielding powerful and deadly weapons. If you were a member of the artillery, you were either dealing with bows and arrows or you had a sling. We've been taught to view David in an almost comical light. How can this little boy go up against a seasoned man of war with just a toy, a, a, a slingshot? But the fact is, it wasn't a toy, a slingshot. It was a sling. That's very different than a slingshot toy. It was considered to be an incredibly devastating weapon. And when rocks are released from the sling, you know, you when they're released from that sling, moving at 35 meters per second, which is substantially faster than the fastest Major League Baseball pitcher, they become deadly. Not only that, the rocks that David used, the stones in the valley of Elah, were not normal rocks, but barium sulfate, which are rocks twice the density of normal rocks. And so ballistics experts say that the stopping power of the rock fired from David's sling was roughly equal to the stopping power of a 45 caliber handgun. He had an incredibly devastating weapon. 
Hebrew artillery members like their cousins in Tassedi, the land of the bow, in Nubia, motherland of the folk from ancient Kemet, were insanely accurate when they let loose rocks from their sling or arrows from their bows. We know from historical records that experienced slingers could hit, maim, or even kill a target up to 200 yards, two football fields away. That's like me using a sling to hit somebody that's in those new apartments that are being built across the street. There's evidence to suggest that slingers were capable of hitting birds in flight. When David lines up against Goliath, he's more or likely, he's less than 20 yards away from this Philistine. It's like from where I am to the entrance to this room. Goliath is a sitting duck. Folk with slings had a long history, a long history of killing big men in heavy armor. According to history, time and time again, from Nubia to Jerusalem, slingers were the decisive factor, factor against the infantrymen, against those dudes in the big heavy armor like Goliath. So when David lines up and fires his weapon at Goliath, he's not looking at this like it's some impossible task. He recognizes that the weapon, the, the tool he has at his disposal and the experience that he brings to the table, the practice and the challenges met over months and years of protecting his father's sheep, he has every intention and every expectation of emerging victorious and hitting Goliath in the most vulnerable spot right between the eyes. He could do this <clears throat> if David was standing where I am and Goliath was across the street. But with the giant just being right there, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. Goliath, the heavy infantryman. He was used to fighting hand to hand, but he was susceptible to the weapons of the slingers. Goliath in scripture says, come to me that I might feed your flesh to the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the field. He's expecting this face to face, hand to hand combat. That's Goliath's expectation. According to scripture, that's King Saul's expectation too. That's why Saul tried to give David the armor. But David would rather use the tools at his disposal. Armor wasn't something that he was used to. It wasn't something readily available to him. It wasn't at his disposal. He knew what his, where his strengths were. With other tools that he had spent his, his entire life using and perfecting, Against them lions and them bears. That's where his strength lied. In the tools at his disposal. So David is this experienced slinger facing a giant weighed down by hundreds of pounds of armor. Heavy weapons useful only in short range combat. Goliath doesn't have a chance. Yet we misunderstand and underestimate David. We also misunderstand and overestimate Goliath. Goliath, according to Gladwell and medical doctors who have weighed in on this subject, probably suffered from a medical issue, the medical issue of giantism. Folk concluded because historically people who are unnaturally taller than everybody else in society Nine times out of nine, they suffer from giantism or acromegaly. Acromegaly, it says, is caused by a benign tumor in your pituitary gland that causes an overproduction of the growth hormone. So you, you can get seven, eight feet tall. And that, 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 that tumor compresses the visual nerves in your brain. And so folk who suffer from giantism often suffer from double vision and profound nearsightedness. In other words, it leaves the person with problematic vision, problematic vision. 
They can only see what's right in front of them. They can't see the big picture. They suffer from double vision. Things are distorted. They misjudge everything. They underestimate folk that they believe are too small and insignificant from their perspective. They are so big that they have messed up vision. They, are, they overestimate themselves. They underestimate others. They see themselves as superior and as better when actually they're the sickest, most needy people in the room. Gladwell notes that Goliath has to be led to the battlefield by a young attendant. He said, why? If this is a grown a man, why does he have to be led to the battlefield by an attendant? <laughs> Goliath. Goliath, his folks. Goliath and all them folk who believe that they're bigger than they really are. They aren't used to having to be nimble and quick. Because they're fat and slow off the years of believing in their own lies. And it's not them that does the work. They've gotten so fat and powerful because of the work of the quote unquote little people. The brilliance of those little people that they take for granted. So anyone smaller in their eyes poses no threat. Goliath is blind and oblivious to David's choice of weapons and to David's power. And so when he sees him or kind of sees him coming, he says, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Sticks? All he had was one stab. He's got that double vision, though, right? This Negro coming at me with sticks. <laughs> but scripture makes a point to show that Goliath was super slow. But that's what happens when you think you are superior to everybody. So the oversized nearly blind, slow, overconfident Goliath is just yards away from a deadly marksman who is ready and willing to use the tool at his disposal. What I'm trying to tell you is this fight is over before it started. Goliath didn't know what hit him. And I think you already know the lesson that we need to take from this retelling of the story of David and Goliath. That no matter how big the problems and challenges that stand before us, no matter how small and insignificant we look in the eyes of folk who erroneously believe themselves to be superior, when we use the tools at our disposal, we are not underdogs and Goliath is not invincible. And Goliath's kin, they know it. Just this past week, an Israeli council official recently said that the biggest threat in their region wasn't the Palestinians. It wasn't their own people, the Jews who were protesting against their government's apartheid ways. It wasn't terrorism from surrounding Muslim nations. She said their biggest threat was black American youth. This is someone who's in power in Israel, all the way across the ocean. She's looking at you, and she recognizes the, the tools we have at our disposal. And she says, yo, that's the biggest threat. They may not know it, but that's the biggest threat. Because these folks have a long history of standing against oppression. These folks have come a mighty, mighty long way. We done thrown everything and the kitchen sink at them and still they rise. The biggest threat to this apartheid system that we trying to run is these black folk over in the U.S. Lord have mercy, please can we keep them asleep? Please can we keep them apathetic? Please can we convince them that voting doesn't matter because they are the biggest threat. Lord have mercy. Even Goliath, with his messed up vision, can see that we've got the tools, we've got the weapons at our disposal to make a difference. But the issue is us. we got to see it for ourselves. We have got to be able to recognize the power that we have. For too long, y'all, we've viewed those who seek, to de seek our demise, we've looked at them as giants, as mighty warriors to be feared. For too long, we viewed ourselves almost like grasshoppers, as underdogs, as lacking when compared to Goliath. 
For too long, we've underestimated ourselves and overestimated everybody else. But we've got to remember, we've got to practice Sankofa and remember that our people have a long tradition of using the tools at our disposal. When we use those tools of our deep spiritual insights to give the world religion, our Dogon cousins use the tools of the mastery of their internal universe to map the external universe in the movement of the stars and planets. Black women use the tool of community and connection to create the national black women's organizations that served as the nerve center and social media network that allowed for the civil rights and black power movements to be successful. A little closer to our time, KRS-One used the tool of two turntables and a microphone to teach that you must learn. Dr. Carter G. Woodson <coughs> used his thirst for knowledge of self to bring us to a knowledge of self. Catherine Dunham used her dance skills and openness to learn from her Pan-African family. George Washington Carver, Neil deGrasse Tyson used the tool of science. Ella Baker used the tool of organization. Charles Hamilton Houston, Thurgood Marshall, Katanji Brown Jackson used the mastery of the law and connection to their people as a tool to help us fight back. What are the tools available to us right now? I'm trying to let you know, Black folk, we got some tools. We have some tools. We, we got some tools. We've got some tools. And we've used them to rise in spite of the madness around us. We have a powerful tool that we can use right now. We got a powerful tool that we must use right now in these perilous times. What is that tool? It's our voice. Our tool is our voice. V-O-I-C-E. Our tool is our voice. V-O-I-C-E. V, we must use our tool of the vote. Those Goliaths who oppress us are so big and full of themselves, they think their voter suppression tactics are enough to stop us. But they better go ask somebody. They got us messed up. They even think that we'll resort to begging for mercy or apathy or give up in accepting the crumbs from Massa's table. But the vote is a tool. It's a tool so powerful that they tried to overthrow their own government because our votes, our votes produced a result in the election they didn't like. Folk will try to convince you that voting doesn't matter. But I tell you to ask the people of Palestine if having or not having the power of the vote matters. If we use the tool of the vote in mass, I mean, hell, any election is just 20, 30 percent of us that vote. If just 40 or 50 percent of us voted, we could take every election ever held. Not only V for the vote, we've got to use our O organization. In the pan African Orthodox Christian Church, we have 70 years of experiences and lessons and knowledge. When you join us, are partner with us, you are not just partnering with an idea or a good intention. You are working with and plugging into 70 years of organizational wisdom. The good, the bad, and the ugly, because you learn from all of it. So you can be some young person who wants to change the world, and you don't have to make the same mistakes that we've already made, because we made those mistakes for you. You're welcome. Also, We've got to use the I, institutions. Our beloved founder, the Honorable Jeremoji Abebe Ajaman, teaches that power lies in institutions. We have a national, global network of institutions through which we can build the power needed to feed, clothe, educate, and employ ourselves. Sure, the institutions aren't where we want them to be, but that's because we got more work to do. And we got another eye that we need to employ. It's called investment. The tool of investment makes our work, our movement, our institutions possible. It makes our growth possible. And then we come to the C, and y'all already know what that is. It's communalism. It's community. I am because we are, and because we are, therefore, I am. Goliaths are always looking 
at the need or the tool of community and connection as a weakness, like a, a harmless slingshot toy. But communalism, community, is not a toy. It's a sling, a powerful, devastating weapon through which all the power in the universe flows. We were created for connection. We were created for community. And when we connect, when we live and use the tool of community, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And then finally, the E, our enlightenment ministry. Our charge is to wake our people up to our divine worth and power. To wake our people up to our divine worth and power to our power, to our inherent dignity, to our greatness, to let young black children know that they are giant killers, to let the seasoned saints know that they too are giant killers, that we come from greatness, that we have greatness coursing through our veins. Our voice is the tool that we have at our disposal, and we gotta use it. And so as I Move to take my seat, as Baptist preachers say. Because Goliath may not be the giant monster that we've made him out to be, he still poses a threat. Because he still wants to feed our flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Goliath sees your presence and mine as an insult. He sees you and I as unworthy of his time and effort. And so we have got to use these tools, individually and collectively. You have got to use these tools. You've got to use your voice. You got to vote. You've got to use your power to invest in organizations. Join an organization, this organization, and if not this, some progressive black focused organization, help to make it stronger. Invest in that institution. Invest in this institution, in the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church. Wherever you go, promote communalism and involvement with community. Connect with your sisters and brothers. And be an evangelist of this enlightenment ministry. So that we can wake our people up to our inherent power and dignity. And when we do all those things, when we do all those things, it will feel as if the fight was over before it even started, and Goliath will not even know what hit him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.